There's a popular expression uh, that I hear often. It encourages people to be on what they call the right side of history. In other words, as cultures and morals and, and worldviews change, uh, you need to keep up with the times that you're in. You certainly don't want to be on the wrong side of history. We'll take Harvard University as an example. When Harvard was founded in 1636, its mission statement included the words to be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life and studies is to know Jesus Christ. Harvard employed exclusively Bible-believing Christians for professors and coursework emphasized character formation. In fact, every diploma used to have printed on them the Latin words meaning truth for Christ and the church. Well, today, as you survey the course offerings of Harvard, just like so many other universities today, they are anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible courses designed to eliminate any worship of Jesus Christ. Universities today would claim that they are now on the right side of history. Back there in 1636, well, they were on the wrong side of history. Now they think they're finally getting it right. Well, like liberal universities today, so many churches are changing their moral ethics, uh, their definitions of gender and marriage and sexuality, claiming, of course, now to be on the right side of history. Well, as we sail back into the Apostle Peter's second letter, now chapter 2, Peter's going to deliver a warning about drifting, about unbiblical professors, so to speak. In fact, Peter begins here by predicting the presence of these false teachers. He writes here in verse 1, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Now, don't miss that warning. Among you. In other words, they're already in the church. This is one of the reasons they're so dangerous. They don't start out by deceiving the church. They join the church. They start out on the right path, but then adopt some wrong perspective. Something changes their thinking from right to wrong. Peter writes in verse 1 that they secretly bring in destructive heresies. You could translate that. They smuggle in error. And here's where they eventually end up. Verse 1 says, they deny the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Well, at first, they they seemed fine. They seemed to be believers. They might have been the most gifted Sunday school teachers or, or church leaders, but they drifted. They, at some point, veered off the biblical path and ended up denying biblical truth. Now, verses 2 and 3 here give us another clue as to what to watch out for. Peter writes that sensuality and greed are all part of their agenda. So beware, uh, beloved, of self-centered, materialistic uh, teachers uh, and those kinds of lifestyles that, that really ought to be a flashing warning sign to you about a teacher who would be a false teacher. Their teaching is going to be more about how you can be happy than how you can be holy, about how you can get what you want in life, rather than giving your life to the Lord. Their teaching will be popular because their beliefs will be comfortable. In fact, even fashionable. Reminds me of what G.K. Chesterton wrote many years ago, that fallacies do not cease to be fallacies because they become fashions. Well, the culture around you, even religious leaders, are going to embrace fallacies and declare with great confidence and and happiness that they are now on the right side of history. Oh, well, let me tell you, God has another point of view. Peter now speaks of the coming judgment of false teachers. And to make his point, Peter in, in one very long sentence here, cites three Old Testament examples of God's judgment. First, you have the sin of angels here in verse 4, which resulted in God confining them to hell. The Greek word translated hell here is Tartarus. Other passages tell us that this is a temporary holding place for certain fallen angels or demons. It's also called in Luke eight thirty one the abyss. It's called, over in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, the bottomless pit. Now, there's a lot of debate on what 
the sin was that caused these fallen angels to be judged and and confined uh, uh, so suddenly. Well, I believe this all connects back to Genesis chapter 6, where fallen angels inhabited sinful men, and through the offspring of these demon-possessed individuals, the human race became corrupted, leading then to that global flood, that global judgment. That's the second judgment Peter addresses here in verse 5 as he writes that God brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, the third judgment that Peter mentions here in verse 6 relates to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, there are many people, even religious leaders, who say this judgment came upon them because they were inhospitable. Well, Peter's referring uh, to their judgment, and the issue, beloved, isn't just about hospitality. It's about homosexuality. Peter writes here in verse 6 that God turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Well, the word here for ungodly doesn't mean inhospitable. It's the same word Peter uses up in verse 5 for the ungodly there. They are unrepentant human beings. So here's Peter's point. Just as God brought judgment upon the unrepentant, wicked individuals in the past, verse 9 here says that there's a coming day of judgment. Let me tell you, our only hope today is to repent of our sin and to call upon the Lord to save us from the judgment on that final day. Because no sin is anything other than sinful. Have you repented of your sin and asked Christ to forgive you? It's going to be tragic for those who realize too late that they thought they were on the right side of history, only to discover they were on the wrong side of God Almighty. Now, to help us avoid these false teachers, Peter reveals some of their characteristics. Here in verse 10, he describes them as bold and willful. Without hesitation, he writes, they blaspheme the glorious ones. What that means is they show no respect for any divinely established authority. In contrast, the holy angels, Peter references here in verse 11, would not even uh, dare assume God's authority in pronouncing judgment against the wicked. Peter goes on to say here in verse 13 that false teachers are reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. In other words, they're bringing a casserole to the church picnic. They're feasting with you. They're enjoying the church gathering. You just don't realize it. You don't know who they really are. Peter says here in verse 15 that they, in reality, are forsaking the right way. Well, they're telling you they're moving over to the right side of history. Peter says they are forsaking the right way. Now, they're going to be on the wrong side of God Almighty now, you might be wondering, how do they gain such a, a popular following? Well, Peter tells us here in verse 18, these false teachers entice people with sensual passions. Verse 19 adds, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. They don't have the power to free anybody. Only Jesus Christ can promise, you will know the truth, and the truth, his truth, will set you free, John 8, 32. Now, with that, Peter gives another warning here in verses 20 and 21. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back. Well, Peter's referring here to people who at one time professed to know Christ, but they eventually chose their sin over Christ. And Peter says it would have been better if they'd never heard the gospel. You see, beloved, there's a greater judgment coming for those who knew the right way but chose the wrong way. The more knowledge someone has of the truth, the greater the judgment when they reject it. So let me ask this question. What side of history are you on today? Let me invite you to the only side that's right. That's the side God is on. That's the side the Word of God 
declares. So come to his side, come to the word of God, and that will place you not just on the right side of history, but on the right side for all of eternity. Well, until next time, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.